Okay, so, hello, let's start. My name is Javier Ruiz. I'm a professor here at UPC, and I will tell you in a very short time, in 25 minutes, something a little about 3D analysis of, so, so how can we use uh, deep learning architectures to process and to analyze 3D scenes, no? or scenes in 3D, okay? So, let me just check how can I, okay, so, so first I will try to motivate a little bit why people are starting to work in uh, using 3D content and to process and to analyze 3D content. Uh, I will talk about point cloud, which is uh, the data representation, the most commonly used data representation of 3D content. Um, a little bit about data sets, no? why it's important to, on, on how the increase of the appearance of 3D data sets have motivated the use of uh, deep learning technologies that uses uh, 3D uh, to recognize or to analyze or to understand uh, sequences or, or 3D objects. Then I will take you a little bit about deep learning considerations. And the most important thing is that the techniques that are used in deep learning to process 3D content. No, I will do some categorization, I will talk about this, and then some conclusion. As I said, I'll go fast, no? Some acknowledgement of, about some students that help me, or I just borrow some of their work to put in this slide. Okay, so the motivation is that, okay, they have appeared new, cheaper sensors that acquire data in 3D, no? Cameras are very cheap, 2D cameras, RGB cameras, but nowadays, we have also sensors that acquire data in 3D. No? So they acquire the depth information of each of the pixel or each of the points of the scene, and you can obtain a 3D representation of the scene. No? Together with these uh, cheap sensors, of course, people are starting to create data sets. No? So people, instead of, or together with uh, RGB data, they also provide the, this 3D data from the sensors. No? So there have been newer data sets with this 3D content. No? So on the one hand, we have this uh, appearance of 3D content, and on the other one, we have several applications nowadays that are very important that uh, you do some analysis in 3D. No? For instance, virtual reality, no? or augmented applications, this is inherently in 3D, so you need to understand the scene in 3D. Also, for instance, autonomous driving. No? Nowadays, autonomous driving is very... Uh, uh, cool topic, no? And also they started to realize that maybe, no, understanding the scene around the vehicle in 3D, it's important, and it helps you to understand the surroundings of the car, no? The, so these are the two motivations. Um, and then let's talk a, a little bit about point clouds, no? As I said, point clouds, it's a common representation of 3D data, and, and basically what it is, is a collection of uh, data points defined by a given coordinate system. No? So we have a series of points, usually at the surface, and usually in Cartesian coordinates. No? So each of the points defines an x, y, z coordinates in the 3D world. No? And you have a bunch of them on the surface, and that creates a 3D object or a, or a scene in 3D. No? So, so basically what I mean with this, no? it's a point card, it's just a, a list of points, no? and at each of these points, at least you need the x, y, z in the, coordinate, in the Cartesian coordinate system of each of the coordinates for each of the points. No? So this is a point cloud. Uh, understood? Yeah? And, uh, and also, you can put extra data into each of these points. No? So the point is a, has a location in 3D, but it can also have information of the color of that location. No? So you can, you can have RGB data for each of these points, meaning the color of that point at that specific location, no? or, or more, eh? you can have orientation, curvature, whatever. So uh, the, the minimum is the x, y, z coordinate, but you can extend that information for each of the points. Okay? And one thing to notice already is that this is much different than an image. No? The, the most uh, different thing or the, the, is that in an image, everything is ordered. So a pixel, a location of the pixel is important, but in here, the location of the point in the list is not important. It's an, an, und, an ordered list, no? Doesn't matter if the point is here or at the end of the list, the point clone representation is the same, no? So the order of the list is different. I will talk about this because it's important how you can use uh, network architectures to process point clouds, okay? And as I said, 
point clouds are the basic structure to define a 3D object or a 3D scene. You can go one step more, which is uh, to use meshes. You know? And uh, in meshes, you not only have the list of uh, points, but you also defined a, uh, a face, no? A, a, I would call it a face, a face between the points, no? A plane between the points, so you have a closed structure instead of a single point structure. I don't know how to say this, no? So you have the list of points and the list of faces and, and the minimum that you need so three points to define a plane, no? So you have these planes around the faces. Again, eh, this is a more complete representation of a 3D scene because you have also not only points but uh, faces of it and you can use this but for the sake of simplicity let me just use point clouds I'll talk about point clouds during the rest of this talk okay um, so 3D no point clouds can define a 3D scene and as I said no there is a new data sets that allow you or provide you with 3D information and annotated 3D information, no? which is important for uh, any learning architecture to uh, process it and to provide some results. No? So very quickly, I can list you some of the most important data sets uh, in 3D. So for instance, for classification, there is this large data set of objects and scans. And, and again, no, it's a set of, in this case, meshes, but it could be point clouds with an annotated um, object, no? So for cars, so you have the class car, and you have several 3D objects for the car, no? So it's a data set, and it's quite big, no? It's 10,000 scans, so it's, it's okay. So for post estimation, for instance, no? It's a data set which is TLS, and you're provided with several objects which are segmented in 3D, and the pose of this object, the pose is the rotation and the translation of the object with respect to the scene. It's annotated, no? So you could create a network to infer pose from the 3D objects, for instance, no? Or, or for instance, in segmentation, no? This, uh, this data set, semantic 3D, with real scenes annotated, no? So, and segmented, so you got a segmentation for the trees, the buildings, roads, etc. no? Or a scan net also, this is for uh, outside, this is an inside, indoor scenes, also annotated, no? For segmentation, so you have chairs, floor, walls, whatever, okay? And, I don't know if this is storage, yes it does. So for instance, for autonomous driving, it's uh, cityscapes, also very known, and, and you're, you don't see it very well, but you're provided here with a 3D point cloud representation of the street, so you can also annotate it, eh? so it's semantically annotated, no? Road, trees, people, cars, whatever. Again, also Use for this, and if you go more more into scene understanding, this is Sun RGBD data sets for indoor scenes, and also I would say this is the most uh, big and com comprehensive one of data sets, which is the Stanford 2D 3D data set, which corresponds to you know, 70,000 scans, again annotated with each of the classes. No, so. As I said, no, point clouds, a lot of uh, data sets nowadays, so people can start thinking about using uh, network architectures to analyze uh, these point clouds, okay? So before reviewing how to do this, let's uh, understand that there are some challenges to process point clouds directly with uh, neural networks, no? The first one, it's... Uh, related to what I said of this un unordered list of points, no? Uh, so the neighborhood is undefined. In an image, you think of an image, no? A pixel, the neighborhood is completely defined, no? The pixel up, it's up in the image, no? It has something, a meaningful uh, location and neighborhood. But in the point cloud, it doesn't, no? I mean, a point in the list which is up or down this doesn't mean anything, no? So there's an undefined neighborhood, and you need to somehow define this neighborhood. Okay. One way to do it, for instance, is, okay, I can define a neighborhood by Euclidean distance, no? If I imagine the point cloud, not the list of point clouds in text, but if I imagine the point cloud uh, x, y, z coordinate, the closer the points uh, in Euclidean distance, no? Then the neighborhood they are, no? The neighborhood is defined by the closest distance. Th that's okay, it's something that you can do, but it's also maybe difficult and sometimes it's not correct, no? For instance, I don't know, I have this bunny here, and if you think about the ear of the bunny, 
and you define a neighborhood, a closest distance, sometimes it can happen that you have points which are close to this, but also points which are close to this, which are very far away from the bunny, no? very far away from the ear at least. No? So uh, sometimes the Euclidean distance is not perfect in that sense. No? Sometimes you can get points which are close in the Euclidean distance, but they are not close in the sense of the semantic sense. No? They are not close to the ear or something like that. We'll talk about this. Eh? Okay, the other problem, maybe more, more related to the, to the uh, intrinsic characteristic of networks, is that there is no lattice. No? In an image, and you think of a convolution. You have seen a convolution, I guess. No? If you think of a convolution in an image, okay, you define the kernel, and the kernel is just a neighborhood of the pixel. No? And then you move the kernel and convolve the image. Okay, you cannot do this in point clouds. No? You, the neighborhood is not defined. The lattice is not defined. So finding somehow no, a kernel to convolve with is difficult or impossible. Okay? So you need to overcome this. I will tell you about it. Okay? And then the other problem is that uh, the point density, no? When you, usually this is due to the, uh, the cameras that are quite 3D, no? If you are quite 3D of the scene, usually points which are closer to the camera have more density, have more points, number of points, that points or surfaces which are far away from the camera, no? And this is a, a light leader representation of a scene, and these which are closer, the density is higher, that things which are farther away, no? And, and also you need to take this into account. So if you think of, a, for instance, a convolution, no? A kernel of a convolution, then the neighborhood here will be smaller than the neighborhood here, no? To get the same number of neighbors, you'll have to get a bigger radius far away than close away. So this is somehow also something that you need to uh, take into account. And understood? Yeah, the other limitations? So what are the solutions to this? Okay, I'm very general, no? There are several ways to deal with this, no? Okay, so how can we use, analyze 3D scenes using, uh, using neural networks? At least I will comment about these five things, okay? So the first one is, I will tell you, is to use two and a half D data. No, it's not 2D, it's not 3D. We go in the middle, okay? I'll tell you about this. The other one is to voxelize, to project. And then there is two, these two, which is, no, no, to directly work with point clouds, we'll, we'll see it. Okay. I'll comment on each of them. My time is... I cannot see the time. Okay, <laughs> okay so let's go to the first one. No, it's used between 2 and, and 3D. No? The idea here is that okay, m most of the sensors that acquire 3D, like Kinect or, or, or another one, they measure the distance pixel by pixel. No? So uh, at the end, they don't have this th uh, list of point clouds, but they have an image, which is a depth information. Each of the pixels have the distance between the pixel and the camera. No? So this is represented in, in black and white. So white is very far away. Black is very close. No? And with this information, of course, you can project back and create the 3D point cloud. No? But it's a, a post-processing step. Okay, so people think, okay, instead of using the point clouds, Let's use this depth image no? and process this depth image. No? It is like a working with 3D information, but in 2D. Understood? And that's why it's called 2 and a half D. Okay. And this is very nice because our depth is an image, so we can use standard convolution, standard neural networks. We don't have to change anything. And it's very easy to use in deep learning architectures. No? And people have been doing this at the beginning was the first thing that people were doing, no? to work with depth. and then. The easiest thing that you can do is that I work with depth as another channel of my image. No? I have RGB, RGB channels, and then I just put another channel, depth, and I feed it into uh, the network, and I hope that it works better than not using the depth information. Okay? And I'm not going to review the literature, but it works better. No? So if you have the depth information, and you plug it into the network, then of course the results that you get, they are better than without that. Okay? Uh, but this is the, the most straightforward way to use it, no? just another channel. But people started to realize that maybe this is not the best one. And they said, no, no, because depth is extrinsically different than RGB. No? RGB has the color information, this is the depth. Using it in the same uh, layers, it's worse than just using another network, like a parallel network, two stream networks, which are called, and one process the depth, and the other one process the RGB, and then you fuse them together at the end. Okay? And this is better than just using depth 
as an extra channel in your input. Okay, and this is a little bit more complicated, but and and the idea or the reasoning behind this is that okay, the 3D information, the depth in this case, you know, is significantly different from RGB. So it takes advantages of having a different network, you know, to learn things and then fuse them at the end. Okay, so these guys uh, did the study and realized this. Understood? Yeah. But again, this is just a very naive way of using 3D information, just with the depth image. Okay. And sometimes there are some sensors, not the Kinect, but LIDAR, that doesn't give you the depth information. Right? They directly give you the point cloud information. Right? So you kind of use this. So people are starting to work in a different way and say, okay, we, we want to use point clouds, we want to use convolutions and networks, uh, but then the lattice is not defined. What can we do? One thing that you can do is to voxelize. Voxelize is like to uh, um, uh, take, uh, I don't know, get the point cloud and divide the point cloud into equally spaced pixels in 3D voxels. No, it's called voxels. You have X, Y, and Z information. No? So, so little cubes that you divide your space and you define an occupancy grid. No, it's like, okay, when I have my 3D object and I voxelize it, in one of these cubes, in one of these voxels, we have points, then the occupancy is true, no? And if one of these voxels is, is empty, then the occupancy is uh, void, is zero, no? And that's the idea of to convert a point cloud, which points can be anywhere, into a regular lattice of voxels, but just voxels are empty or not, no? And no, again, you can have more information than if, if it's empty or not, because you can add the color of the voxel, the curvature, or whatever. Okay, so you can transform this. And in this transformation, the good thing is that, okay, now it's a regular voxel grid. It's like an image 2D extended, like a matrix in 3D. So instead of using 2D convolutions, you can use 3D convolution. But you can convolve and use these kinds of networks with this input. Okay, understood? And, and the only difficult part will be, okay, to define the voxel, no? I mean, if you, def of course, you have this idea, no? If you choose a big voxel, no? Of course, your resolution of the scene is very poor, no? So the results that you get will not be very good. On the other hand, if you decrease the size of the voxel, the resolution is very good, but you use a lot of memory, no? Because you have to put a lot of information in empty spaces, eh? Because a lot of voxels will be empty of air, and then, but you have to put information there, that they're empty. Okay? So the memory increases and it's difficult to manage. No? So this um, voxelization is difficult. And also, remember, no, the density of point cloud is not very regular. No? Closed objects are very... And then it's difficult to find a voxel which is uh, good for closed ob objects and very far away objects. Okay? So that is always difficult. But in any case, people have tried. I put here two references. No? Uh, and, but the idea is this one is, we have points, we convert these points into voxels. Once we have voxels, we can apply regular neural networks in 3D instead of 2D. Okay? So for instance, this guy did it for classification, and also this one for classification, the other way around. No? He's going bottom up, and here's this up to bottom. But the idea is that is to use voxels and then use 3D convolutions to perform the uh, layers. Understood? Yeah? Okay, so another possibility, yeah, is we want to process a point cloud, and then it's projected into images. No? That is, okay, we have a point cloud, and if we project it back into several images, and then we process the images that are the resulting of projecting these point clouds. No? And again, no, because they are images, we can use a standard uh, neural networks uh, or convolutional neural networks to process them. But the idea is this one, eh? to have a point cloud, project it into several images, and then process the images separately, okay? Uh, and for instance, we have been doing this, no? One of my students is doing this. The idea is to have two point clouds and finding correspondences between them, no? So imagine that you have two point clouds of the same scene, taken from two different cameras, and, and then you want to match them. You want to uh, register them into the same position. So you need to find uh, the same things in both of the point clouds. I don't know, maybe this point and that point there. And, and one way to do it is to project. No? So you can project these point clouds into images, 
you know, like this one, uh, standard projection, and then you know, the result of that projection, you feed it into a network, and now there are images, and the network can tell you if they are uh, a match or not, and if they are a match, then you have the match in 3D. You know? Just using a projection to do this. Eh? And people have been doing complicated things. No? We have been doing uh, normal things, and people tend to compli overcomplicate things. For instance, these guys no, try to recognize 3D objects, like chairs, by doing no, a lot of projections around 360 degrees, and they have a lot of images, they process the images, they join together, so they classify. No? Instead of point clouds, they just classify all of the images and mm, merge them together to do a final classification. So, it's okay, no? uh, so, so one of the questions maybe that you have is that, okay, so we have these two ways to dealing with point clouds, no? at least voxelizing and projecting, which sound similar, no? One uses 3D convolutions, the other uses 2D convolutions. How do they compare, no? Is it better to use one or the other one? So people already have done that. And, and this, these guys, what they found out, no, with their experiment is that usually do, doing projections is better than voxelizing, no? Or at least, no, similar uh, architectures that uses multi-view uh, achieve better results than using pure volumetric or voxelizing uh, point clouds. Okay, so I have to say that, but I also have to say that people are closing the gap. No, there are new architectures uh, with uh, that voxelize point clouds, which are getting closer to this projection. So I will say that it's more or less the same. Eh? For instance, these guys are are doing this uh, thing. No, that they are actually move, rotating the the view and then feeding into 3D convolutions and then doing the merging, and they achieve similar results to projection. No? So they, they are closing the gap. I would say they are mostly similar in the now. Okay, yeah, I'm going fast. Can I move on? So what remains now in the talk is, okay, well, we can voxelize, we can project, but can we really, ca ca can we just use point clouds directly? Let's go, let's do a network which uses point clouds directly and see what happens, no? And, and yes, there is, no, at least, there are, there are many, but this one is the first one that I saw, uh, which is an architecture, they, they, they created an architecture that directly tried to process this list of point clouds, okay? You have to think that, and they use it to classify, to do segmentation, and to do same, so to, to different applications, and it was working, so, so the network was working fine. So they proposed this, I'm not gonna go into detail, but at least, the important thing is that they are not convolutions here. They, they can be, no? because they are a list of point clouds. There is no neighborhood defined. They cannot do convolutions. So they need to do st standard no? uh, MLPs, no? multi-layer perceptors, to process everything. No? So they, they cannot do otherwise. Okay? And maybe they, they, they did things like this, but I would say that the clever bit for me is this one. So at the beginning, they put a mini network here that what it does is that tries to be invariant to this unordered list of things. No? The idea of this network is to transform the points so every time you feed a list of points, it gets transformed, so the order is independent of the order, so the order is not important. No? And I think that, that was, I think, the clever bit of this network. So they feed this here, they also process a little bit, and then they put another network which has the same meaning as this. Sorry. Uh, but for the, fe the feature space, no, once we learn a little bit, now we have features here, and then we also transform them so they are aligned, so they do it twice, no? Uh, and with that information, they can process the points and, and get a solution. But, and again, so it works, so, so it, was, it was nice. Okay, understood? Yeah? And, uh, and then nowadays, there's another trend, and it's to use graphs. Okay. So if you think about it, graphs are very related to point clouds, no? because at the end they are just points, and then if you somehow can make a relationship between points, then you have a graph. No? And nowadays people are using uh, graphs to process point clouds, and they're using this, what is called these graph neural networks. No? So they're neural networks that work with graphs. And uh, the nice thing about these uh, graph neural networks is that they can be seen as a generalization of standard convolutions. No? So I will 
say something about this, no? But right now, let's say that you can think of a, an operation into a graph as a generalization of a convolution. Okay? I'll say about something about this, no? But the idea is this, no? Is we have a graph. A graph, you know what it is, no? It's a set of nodes, which for us will be point cloud, points, no? And a set of edges, which is a connection between the points. So if they are closer, they are connected. If they are not, then they are not connected, no? And the idea of a graph neural network is that they, the features of the node, no? So we have nodes, we have features of a node. It can be color, RGB, it can be whatever, no? And we want to process them. So at the end of the network, instead of features, we have a classification, for instance. No? So this point is a chair, or this point is a whatever. No? So the idea is to process these features along the network and then provide some output. It's the same as an image, no? An image at the starting of the network, each pixel, the feature is the RGB color, and then you put some features, and at the end you have a, a, a feature which defines something or classifies something. Okay, so, so in, in graph neural networks, the idea is that, okay, each node has a feature, no? Let's represent it with this message, this little envelope, and then we define an activation function, just a function that transforms this uh, feature into something which is fed to the neighbor's node. No, so, oops, sorry. So here we can call this, no? So, so the new feature of the node will be the aggregation of all the neighbors, of all the features of the neighbors that goes through the activation function, no? They are processed through the activation function. No? They, 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 they build together, so they create a new feature uh, from the features of the neighborhood node. Uh, understood? Yeah? And you do this step by step, no? So in the first step, the features of these surrounding neighbors will update this one, and then the next step you do the same, no? And of course, in the next step, oops, if you think about this, if you increase the receptive field, again, the first step, this node will be updated by these uh, three nodes, and then in the next one, the features of the node, which is updated with this one, will fit into this one, no? So at each of the steps, the receptive field of the network increases, no? Again, I will say it again, eh? Is that in the first step, if you think of the black node, only this node will affect the feature of this uh, black node. In the first step, that's okay. But in the next step, because we do it again, now this one has been affected by the feature of that one, no? and then it will affect this one. So each step of the process increase the receptive field or how each of the node gets updated with the neighborhood node. Okay? But, but that's the idea. Eh? To, Keep on debiting, but each at each step, okay? And then you have two kinds of uh, graph neural networks because you can implement it. Of course, this step is infinite, so uh, unless you do it a several steps until all the nodes are processed. And uh, there are two ways to do this. One is uh, some spectral methods, and the other one is spatial methods, okay? A spectral method will do this in one go, no? They, they'll transform the graph into a... Uh, frequency domain, no? and do the uh, processing there, okay? So all the steps will be done in one uh, single step, no? in, the pr in the frequency domain, and the spatial methods are iterative, no? so you go step by step for all of the nodes. So I would say the spectral methods, the problem is that because you have to create this uh, Fourier transform, the computational demand is high, I'll, but you can reduce it by doing approximations to the Fourier transform, okay? And the main problem that they have, they are not very used because in this case, because you do this Fourier transformation or, or this frequency transformation, the size of the graph or the structure of the graph needs to be fixed, no? So you can define this transformation with a graph, I don't know, of 10,000 nodes, and that's it, no? And if you change the graph because you remove or add some nodes, then your transformation doesn't work, no? Because it's fixed. So to overcome this problem, you can do it in a spatial uh, domain. The spatial domain is similar to what I explained. No? You go node by node, you update and process all the nodes, iteration by iteration. Okay? And, and in general, they are more efficient because at least it's not dependent on the graph structure. No? So you can create a network that works with point clouds or graphs of not a fixed size, which is important. Okay? Understood? Yeah. And just to go back to what I said originally, you can see this as a generalization of a convolution, eh? because if you think of an image, I don't know. well, an image of three by three, 
no? and you're doing a convolution with a 3 by 3 kernel, you can see these pixels as the neighbors of this node. No? So you can create a small graph no? with all the neighbors connected to this. No? And then so you choose the neighbor appropriately. And then the activation function of this convolution, what will be? Can you have followed me, you can answer what will be the activation function of this um, graph neural network to implement a convolution. Can you think about this? When you implement a convolution, no? the kernel, what, what does the kernel do? The kernel is just a matrix no? that multiplies each of these values by something. No? Multiplies by something it's just a multiplication of this value by the value of this pixel and then adds everything together. No? So if I go back and I go this, no? you have the message which is the, in this case, the value of this pixel and you do the activation function that in this case is just a multiplication. No? So in this case the activation function is just a multiplication of the message, which is the value of the pixel, with some weight, that's the activation function, no? to find the weight that multiply this. Understood? So at least it is true that it's a generalization of the convolution. You can do this with a convolution. Of course, if you want to do just one convolution, you only do one time step, no? Because you're only looking at the surrounding pixel. You don't go farther away than this. Okay? It's just one step and that's it. Yep? Understood? So I'm happy to say that. And here, again, eh? this is nowadays very uh, research in the community, at least people are starting to use graph neural networks to solve any kind of problems. I just put this, but nobody, I just checked in CVPR 2019, one of the main conferences in computer vision. Uh, at least I saw around 20 papers with graph neural networks, no, using graph neural networks to solve many problems. So it's really, really high, you know, it's gaining momentum in the community. So I finished with this. Uh, Hopefully, at least we saw that you know, point clouds are a way to represent uh, 3D uh, data. Working with point clouds directly is not uh, straightforward, so you need to do th things, and people try to or use 2.5D, you know, depth images, or voxelized, or project, or nowadays people are using directly point clouds or graphs by using uh, graph neural networks, for instance. Okay? And that's it. I don't know my time because I don't have a clock, but <laughs> sorry. Okay. And I'll finish here. So you, any questions, comments? You want any? No? Then I'll handle it to you.